Now, coming back to India again, if you see, there is a value chain distress that we find. In fact, a study has shown that 90% uh, if not more of small and marginal farmers who themselves constitute a good deal more than 75-80% of the total number of farms, farmers in India are, they, are if you, if the wage factor is also, you know, calculated, they are in fact in a negative income situation. So if you look at the opportunity for a wage away, um, um, away from agriculture and particularly with this program like the Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme being there, there's no reason for them to stay in agriculture at all. They are there only because they have no choice. So this sort of thing is not going to continue, especially if you look at the agrarian relations not changing at all, the alarmingly growing tenancy in the country, and especially that factor is causing a lack of attachment to land with the result, natural resources are, get, you know, uh, are under pressure and land and water have become major issues. And in the process, even atmospheric pollution and related concerns have arisen. I, we said all this in our crop holiday report a few years ago. But unfortunately, even today, we persist in the same sort of logic. Now, for, you, know, you take, for instance, the, the cotton crop. In a year in which the cotton production was peaking in the country and the cotton productivity was peaking in the country, the maximum number of cotton producing farmers committed suicide. Now that should be enough to show us that production and productivity, and these are not the issues which should, you know, sort of occupy our attention, but ultimately the so-called cobweb theorem of gluts and shortages causing these fluctuations in the market and exposing the farmer to risks which are not covered and which we are unable to cover no matter how many times we change the crop insurance scheme and all that. Therefore, ultimately, can we or can we not offer the farmer a guarantee that his investment in agriculture is safe? I think this is exactly the question that we'll have to answer in the future. Of course, this is not to downplay the achievements of the country. I mean, India has had a series of excellent uh, you know, achievements to its credit. It's got a remarkable a track record from the days of the Green Revolution, which uh, Dr. Swaminathan Doyen of Indi Indian Agriculture is very much around, and his his uh, students and his uh, army is uh, star-studded ICR all over the country. We've got a number of uh, heroes in various areas like wheat and agronomy and rice and cotton and things like that, and. Certainly, they have brought us a tremendous name internationally. And ours is a country where people like Daniel Ben-Hur worked. And we had an agriculture minister called Subramanyam in the 1960s, who is still remembered the, for the uh, foresight and uh, visionary outlook he brought to agriculture. And we've had these multicolored revolutions. We've had a green revolution, we've had a white revolution, we've had a yellow revolution, and a uh, blue revolution in fish, etc. And both the ICR and the extension system and programs like the National Agricultural Research Project right up to the National Ag Agriculture Innovation Project which is currently on and then the steps we have taken in irrigation, fertilizers, chemical fertilizers uh, being popularized and in fields like processing and marketing, especially in say milk in Gujarat, remarkable changes have taken place. And Therefore, from the ship to mouth existence in the 1960s, as it was called in the PL 480, the Public Law 480, which pledged supply of wheat to India, until the ship arrived, there was, you know, no guarantee that there would be, you know, enough food to feed the population. That was this ship to mouth days. From and today we have embarrassing surpluses. All our go downs are, you know, surplusing with the food grain. We don't even know what to do with it. And as it was being mentioned earlier, the we are the largest producer of milk, cashew nut, coconut, tea, ginger, turmeric, black pepper, you, you name it. But then there's a French proverb which says that the more things change, the more they remain the same. All these have happened, but then suicides are still happening, people are leaving farming, tenancy is increasing, agrarian relations haven't changed, the big five still persist in what I feel is the cafeteria approach. Their product is not designed to the farmer's taste. 
they have a set of options, you take them or leave them. So th that is not going to work anymore. I think they'll have to learn how to make things which the farmer wants. Otherwise, this, uh, no matter how many achievements we pile up to our credit, the edifice of the production system, which is the individual farm, I think it will continue to suffer.